Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Join my VIP program. It's time. Join my VIP program and speak English powerfully. Improve much faster. Speak powerfully. Speak fluently. Think in English. Time for you to be an advanced English speaker. Just commit. Commit. Do it. Join. Be a VIP member. Work each month, every day, listening to the lessons. You will improve, improve, improve. Make that commitment. That's how you succeed. That's how you master. Master, master English. Join my VIP program today. Join at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Okay, I need to share. I'm going to confess something. I'm going to share. <laughs> share something with you. I'm a bit bored. I'm a bit bored. This happens to me sometimes. I get bored. I need challenges in my life. I like interesting challenges. And at the moment, I'm a bit bored. And specifically, I am a bit bored with exercise and fitness. On one hand, I do enjoy exercise. I enjoy fitness very much. But on the other hand, I do get a little bored just doing it for no reason. So, for example, I like to do calisthenics. I'm doing calisthenics. I kind of changed my program recently, what I'm doing. I'm doing a program from the book Convict Conditioning. I'm enjoying it already, making some improvements, which is great. But I find, maybe this is just me, but I find I am more motivated, I'm more excited, I'm more enthusiastic about fitness, about exercise, when I am training for a specific event, a challenge. It just makes it more interesting to me. It helps my motivation, gives me something to look forward to, uh, to train for. I like that. I like the idea of training instead of exercise. Let's talk about these two words, the difference and meaning of these two words. Exercise just means any activity you do for fitness, physical exercise. Exercise has other meanings also, but for this meaning, it just means anything you do for your body, your physical fitness. So push-ups, that's exercise. Walking, running, that's exercise. Lifting weights is exercise. I, any sport, almost any sport, also exercise, right? It's just any physical activity, really, for fitness. That's exercise. Training, on the other hand, physical training, again, we're talking about physical training here. Training has several meanings also. But here, physical training. Physical training is a similar idea, but it's a little different. Because training has the idea, in the meaning of this word, training means you're training for something. It has the idea of a goal, a purpose. A more specific purpose. Exercise is very, very general, as you can imagine, right? You can see that uh, playing soccer is exercise, walking is exercise, golf is exercise, a little swimming is exercise, lifting very heavy weights is exercise. Those are very different activities. 
they're all exercise and they're all just very gen it's just a general idea Training, though, has the idea of a specific goal. You train for something. You're training for something. For some event, for some competition, for some goal. It has more of that idea of a specific purpose. So I, personally, like training more than just general exercise. I get bored with general exercise after a while. I like it somewhat. Like I, I enjoy walking for exercise. I don't need a goal for walking usually. I just like walking around. It's I enjoy that. But for other kinds of exercise, I, I do enjoy training. I like to have some kind of uh, challenging goal just for the fun of it. No, no real reason. Just I find it's fun. So, for example, when I was doing running a lot, when I was, I don't know, several years ago, and I was focused on running, and I uh, was doing a lot of running, I would get bored just running, 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 running after a while. So I always liked to train for a specific race. I would choose a race, maybe a few months in the future, maybe half a year in the future. A marathon, maybe, or something like that, maybe a shorter race. And then I would train for that race. So then each day I was running and each week I was running. I had a plan, right? I'm, I was building, <laughs> building up and trying to improve for that goal, that event, that r specific race. Instead of just running for exercise with no real goal, I was training for a specific event. I find, for myself, I, that helps me to be much more motivated and focused when I'm doing exercise. When I've done the pilgrimage trips that I did, Shikoku and the Camino de Santiago, I also use those as a physical training, training goals. So for I don't know, probably about six months before I did those trips, I trained. I, I, w I did running. I did a lot of walking. I did some other exercises right, to prepare for those trips. Recently, I have not had any events. I haven't been training for anything, and so this is why I have started to feel a little bored with my fitness. And so I've decided I need to do some kind of event, just for fun, just for fun, just for motivation. And I was thinking, what should I do? What should I do? Well, I could run a marathon again, yeah, but uh, I've already done that. And I, I kind of want more balanced fitness. Running is very, very, very much uh, endurance. It's great for endurance, but it's not very good for strength and, and you know, muscle, that kind of stuff. General, bigger movements. So I thought, I thought, I thought. And then I realized, too, I'm going to be traveling a lot. Hmm, what to do? What to do? And I started realizing, well, my birthday will be in March. Well, five and a half months from now, something like that. I thought, well, that's a good, that's a good time to, to choose an event. Because I could, that gives me enough time to train for something, you know, kind of a little more difficult. More difficult than usual. And it's a good symbol. Oh, on my birthday, I'll do some big tough event. It's kind of inspired by Jack LaLanne. Jack LaLanne was a famous health and fitness teacher in the United States. Really fantastic. He would do this. I remember he would do this, especially as he got older, like after middle age to keep himself motivated, also to inspire other people, to show them that they could stay healthy and strong while they got older. 
he would do this. He would do uh, fitness challenges on his birthday or near his birthday. And he would do some big crazy thing on his birthday. Each time was something different. For example, I think one time he did, uh, I can't remember, a thousand pull-ups in... It took several hours, of course, to do a thousand pull-ups, but that's a lot of pull-ups. <laughs> uh, another birthday, he he swam across the uh, um, San Francisco Bay, which is not easy. It's very strong currents, and he didn't just swim. He had a chain, and he was he chained himself to a, a bunch of boats, little boats, and people were sitting in the boats, and he. He pulled them across the bay, across the water, swimming. <laughs> so he did stuff like this, kind of these crazy fitness challenges on his birthday. It probably gave him good motivation. He was training for something. So the rest of the year, right, he had that as his goal, as his standard. Oh, I got to stay in good shape because next birthday I'm doing this crazy event. And then when he did the events, you know, he got to show people, look, I'm 65 years old and I'm doing this tough event. So you can, you can exercise, you can still be in good shape as you get older. That was his mission in life, really, was to show people how to, how to stay healthy and fit, to have a good quality of life, even as they got older. And he did this himself. He was a great example. Even in his 90s, just before he died, he was still in quite good shape, had very good energy. His mind was very sharp. Jacqueline is the number one, the best example I know for aging well. He just aged very well. As he, he Of course, he got older and... Of course, he lost a little bit of strength, but he just, his mind was sharp, he had great energy, and he kept himself in good physical fitness right up until he died. I think for most of us, that's how we'd love to live as we get older, right? He lived long, he lived into his 90s. And just as importantly, he lived well. So, inspired by this idea, I started to think, well, I should do something. What can I do for my next birthday? And maybe I should just create a challenge. That's what Jack Lane used to do. Instead of signing up for some race you know, that someone else organized, I could just create anything I want. I can just make a challenge. I can decide the rules right now, and then I can train for it. So that's what I'm going to do. I think that's what I'm going to do. And then I got the idea, hey, you can join me. You, the Effortless English family, you could join me if you want to. We have a lot of Effortless English members who are also into health and fitness. They like doing exercise. So I thought, hey, this is something we could do together. We could design this so that each of us could do it in our own hometowns, wherever we are. So here's my idea. Right now, this is what I'm thinking. We can discuss this on social media. You can tell me your ideas. But here's my first idea. My idea is to do a trek, a hike, also called a ruck, R-U-C-K, rucking. This means walking with a backpack. So it's walking, but you add weight. You got to carry some weight on your back, which makes it more difficult, of course. Uh, a lot, army guys do a lot of rucking. Guys in the mil military in general, they do lots and lots of rucking, right? They got to walk around long distances with a uh, big heavy backpack. And that's kind of my favorite kind of exercise right now. I like rucking. I pref I like, I'm enjoying rucking more than running at the moment. So I want to do a rucking challenge. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to be 51 years old. So how about we'll do around 50, 51, 50 something miles. 50 to 60 miles, something in that range, rucking, and well, I'll do it in two days, so two back-to-back -back days, which is a lot. That's a long distance. That's a those are that's two 25-mile days, 
26, 27 mile days. Those are long, long days. Especially with weight on your back. And that's almost a marathon. It's, it's about a marathon, actually. 26.3, I think it is, miles for a marathon. So that's basically a marathon each day. Two marathons in a row. So you do a marathon on one day, probably do it on the weekend. So let's say on a Saturday, do a marathon. And the next day, Sunday, do another marathon. Of course, that is very difficult. Running it would be very, very difficult. But even walking it with, with a backpack with some weight would not be easy. <laughs> this, uh, I remember my first two days on the Camino de Santiago, Joe and I, we did something like this. Our first day was tough because we went up and over the Pyrenees Mountains. So it was a challenging, long first day. And then our second day, we probably did, I can't remember, it was something like that, 25 miles, about that, to go into the town of Pamplona. So we did two back-to-back -back very tough days, and we were really tired. So that's a great, this is a good challenge, I think. Because it would be tough, certainly not easy, to do 50 miles in two days, or 55 miles, whatever we do. But then just to make it more interesting, I thought, <laughs> I, I'm also trying to do calisthenics, right? Some push-ups, pull-ups, body weight, strength exercises. So I thought, well, I should do a, a fitness test at the beginning of, before starting the walk, right? Right before it, I'll also have a list of uh, exercises to do to test myself. So I have to reach a certain level. So for example, do 50 push-ups, uh, I don't know, 15 to 20 pull-ups, some squats, uh, handstands or handstand push-ups, something like that. I don't know the exact number yet, but something like that. Do that right at the beginning. I got this idea from GORUCK. GORUCK is a company, they make backpacks. I like their backpacks, but they also do races. They also do these military type of events. I mean, they're not actually, they're not races because they're not trying to beat the, a time. It's, they're more like group fitness challenges. And they often start their event. They'll start their events with this kind of uh, exercise um, challenge where they do a lot of push-ups and sit-ups and things like that. <laughs> They do that first, then they do a lot of rucking, they walk uh, long distances for many, many hours, and then maybe, you know, every, sometimes they'll stop and they do other kinds of fitness challenges also. So I thought we could do that too. I'll add one more part to the challenge. Maybe every hour during this, these two days, every hour, stop and do some burpees. If you don't know what a burpee is, a burpee is a kind of body weight exercise. You, uh, you start standing up, you're standing normally, then you drop down, and you get into a push-up position. You do one push-up, and then you stand up. That's one burpee. They're not easy. Try it. <laughs> Try to do ten, quickly. You'll get very tired very quickly. So I thought, okay, we could do that too. I could add burpees to this challenge. So now it's a very, very difficult challenge. <laughs> so you start day one with uh, a bunch of exercises, push-ups, pull-ups, body weight type exercises to test that. And then start the walk. And it's going to be a two-day walk, very long days, both days. Carry weight on her back. And I'll, I'm not sure how much weight, maybe 20 pounds, something like that. And then every hour, stop and do some burpees. I don't know how many burpees. 10 burpees, 20 burpees, maybe more. This, was, this would be the challenge. And what's cool is, see, we could all do this because we'll have a, a general, an approximate distance, about 50 miles, 50 to 60 miles. So I'll choose my own route 
my own path. I'm thinking for mine, I would like to do, I would like to walk from Kyoto. There's a temple in Kyoto. A, it's a Buddhist temple in Kyoto. It's my wife's main temple. It's called Toji Temple. So I'm thinking I would start at Toji Temple in Kyoto and then walk to Koyasan. Koyasan is in the mountains in the south of Japan. It's also a big Buddhist temple area. Now that would be about 60 miles, 60. So that's longer than <laughs> the 50 I was thinking, but it's that's a cool that that would be a cool trip. I'd walk from Kyoto, then walk south, go through Osaka, and then out of Osaka into the mountains and then f finishing in Koyasan the second day. That would be kind of a cool trip. I'm, so I'm thinking that would be my path. But see, you could choose your own path. You could just use Google Maps, for example, or any map program, and just find, just, just find or create a path that's about the same distance, about 50 miles, which is you know, a little under, it's about 90 kilometers. You could just walk around your city. You could walk from your town to another town, or you could do something else inside your own country or your own area. You could do it right where you live, or you could go somewhere and do it. It doesn't matter. But everybody could decide. We could all do different things. And what would be kind of cool, I think would be kind of fun, is then on Gab or social media, we could each share the path we have chosen right so i'll sh i can give i'll share information about kyoto and osaka and koyasan and the path i'm going to walk and then you could share information about the path you're going to walk and give information about if it's in your country oh i'm starting here then i'm going here and you could tell why why are you choosing this path and then when we finally do it in march or early April, some around there, then we could each share pictures from our walks. And each of us could share pictures, we could share stories uh, about, you know, how was it? <laughs> was it difficult? Was it easy? Probably not easy. Uh, take some pictures along the way and all, we could all be doing this on the same weekend. Even though we're in different countries all around the world, it would be kind of cool because then we're all sharing pictures and stories from our own home countries. And we're all sharing this experience, this fitness challenge together, even though we're doing it, the fitness challenge, all over the world in all these different places. So I think that would be kind of cool. I think it'd be kind of fun to do that. And then I could see all your, you know, see what you chose. We could get pictures from Brazil, pictures from Turkey, pictures from Saudi Arabia, pictures from different places in Europe and the United States and all through Asia. I'll share mine from Japan. So I think this could be a pretty cool, quite an interesting fitness challenge for us all to do those of us who like fitness tell me what you think on gab gab.com gab.com and then follow me aj hoge aj h o g e i'm curious curious what you think i'll let you know as i think about this more a cool thing about doing this walk, doing it as a ruck, is that you can listen to effortless English lessons while you do it. <laughs> this is one of the things I like about rucking compared to running. When I run, I don't know why, but when I run, I don't like listening to things. I don't like listening to music. I don't like listening to audiobooks. I don't like listening to language lessons. I, I don't know. When I'm running, I, I, I'm just focused on the run. Some people can do that, but for me, I can't. But when I walk, I like walking because it's, it's slower. And therefore, I find I enjoy 
I can think more clearly about things. I can enjoy listening to audiobooks or listening to other things. I enjoy more just looking around where I'm walking, the environment, the people. This is one of the reasons I've enjoyed rucking so much. By carrying a, a weight within a backpack, I get still get a good fitness benefit, but a little bit slower, which for me is enjoyable. So you could, for example, get my pronunciation course. As you train for this challenge, each day you go for long walks, bring your phone, bring your iPod or whatever, and listen to the pronunciation lessons, listen to the VIP lessons. And you'll get a lot of repetition as you need. You'll get the deep learning. This will give you lots and lots of great time to listen to those pronunciation lessons, practice your pronunciation, improve your pronunciation so you speak very, very, very clearly. So everyone understands you every time you speak English. Of course, get my pronunciation course at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. It's a good combination, my VIP program plus the pronunciation course. Put them together. Get them both. Get them both at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Mentality. We talked about mentality yesterday. We talked about mentality at the end of our Alchemist Part 1 show. Santiago at the end of Part 1 had to choose. He had to choose his mentality. This was the choice. I like the way Paul Cuello uh, shared and described Santiago's choice. His choice, it was not really his choice of action. It wasn't, what should I do? Of course, he did ask the question, what should I do? Should I stay or should I go? Should I go back to Spain? Should I stay and try to keep going? That was his first question. But then, very quickly, Santiago realizes that the question is actually more deep and internal. And instead, he changes the question for himself. He realizes, no, no, no. The question I must answer is, what mentality should I have? What mentality should I choose? Hmm, got some little children here at the uh, playground. I'm going to move because they're getting a little loud and noisy. Kids can be noisy sometimes, you know? So anyway, Santiago realizes the most important choice is not really what to do. The most important choice is how to think. Which attitude should he choose? Which belief should he choose? Which mentality or mindset should he choose? He realizes this young man, Santiago, he realizes, ah, this is the very important question. Do I choose a mindset of a victim? I am a victim. Or do I choose a mindset of adventurer? Basically like a hero. He realizes this is the key question. Mindset. As I said during the show, that first one is so dangerous and yet so popular. Very popular now. <laughs> very popular now in our media. Very popular now in our cultures around the world. The victim mentality. The victim mindset. The victim mindset is encouraged. The media, the big corporate media, right? The billion dollar companies that make TV shows, that give you the news, that give you newspapers, that give you magazines, that give you movies, everywhere. They all encourage the victim mindset. 
They very much want you to choose the victim mindset. That's why they constantly talk about the victim mindset. That's why they encourage the victim mindset. They want you to think like a victim. And this is why they constantly push the idea of evil racism. Everybody's an evil racist. The reason you are not succeeding, the reason you are unhappy is because you're a victim of racism. Or they encourage women to believe they're victims of sexism. Or young people are victims of ageism and discrimination. Or older people, they're victims of age discrimination also. They want everybody to feel they are victims, victims, victims. Poor you. Poor you. You should ask yourself, why? Why do they want you to think like a victim? Why do they encourage this victim mindset so much? Well, it's because it makes you weak and easy to control. Victims are easy to control. Victims are weak. Just think of the word victim. What do you imagine? Somebody who's weak, right? Somebody who's weak and a stronger person hurts them or cheats them or controls them. Right? The victim is always the weak one. Victims are weak. Victims are easy to control. Victims are powerless. There's two sides of this victim mentality. Number one, it's for yourself. It's very dangerous to think of yourself as a victim. This should be obvious. When you think of yourself as a victim, you feel weaker. And indeed, you become weaker because your mindset will create your reality. If you think you're weak, if you believe you are weak, if you feel weak, weak, weak all the time, well, indeed, you will act weak. <laughs> and you will indeed become weak. Weaker and weaker and weaker. The victim mentality makes you weaker and weaker and weaker. When you decide to think like a victim, you blame everybody else for your problems. It's all those bad people. Everyone blames somebody else, all these victims. Like I said, some people blame, oh, it's those evil white people, or it's the evil black people, or it's the evil them, or them, or them, or them. It's the evil men, it's the evil women, it's this, right? Pointing their fingers, blame, blame, blame. Or some people blame very specific people. Oh, it was my dad, it was my mom, it was this person, my boss. Blame, blame, blame. But again, when you blame, you are saying, they are powerful and I am weak. Again, that's the danger of thinking like a victim. Of course, people do bad things. Of course, that happens. Yeah, I've been cheated also in my life. Most people have. But the point is, do you focus on that and decide that you are a victim and therefore get weaker and weaker? Victims are passive. The more you think like a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim, you become more passive. You don't take action. You don't take responsibility for your life. Instead, you believe that other people are, are in control. Other people have the power and you don't. When you think like a victim, you don't solve problems. Your problem-solving ability goes down and down and down, gets worse and worse and worse. Right? Because if you feel, if you feel that you're powerless, if you feel you're weak, if you feel you're a victim, then you're not creative. You don't look for solutions. You don't go out and solve those problems. You don't fight for yourself. You give up. 
you pity yourself. Poor me. Poor me. That's the, <laughs> the best way to describe the victim mindset, right? You just think, poor me, poor me, poor, poor me. Now, I do understand, of course, this is a natural reaction. We all have that thought sometimes. I do too. Poor me. But the point is, like Santiago, that was his first thought too, right? That's the first thing. Santiago thought, poor me. I got my money got stolen by this thief. Poor me. I'm a victim of a thief. So this is uh, basic human psychology. Okay, we all think this way at some time. So you, that's fine, okay? Th that's going to happen. This thought will probably come into your head when bad things happen. Why, why, why? Poor me, poor me. That's okay. What's important is what do you do next? It's the choice you make after that. That's what the alchemist is showing. He has that first reaction, poor me, like all of us do. But then, what does he do next? He doesn't stay there. He doesn't continue to focus on it. He realizes, no, 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 no. I've got to make a choice. Okay, I feel poor me. I feel like a victim. But wait. I need to decide. Do I really want to think like a victim? Do I really want to believe that I'm a victim? Or do I want to choose a stronger mindset? He thinks about it. He stops himself. And then he thinks about it, and then he realizes, ah, this is not good. This, this, if I think like this, things will only get worse for me, not better. So he realizes, no, 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 I need to change my mindset. I'm going to choose a different mindset. I'm going to choose to be a hero. I'm going to choose to have the mindset of an adventurer, of a hero, an explorer. This is another great example of really positive psychology. Something happens in life. We have a first reaction. It's a, it's a natural reaction, usually an emotional reaction. This is normal. And it's, it, usually we can't control that first reaction. Right? It just happens. It happens so fast. It's very, very difficult to control that first reaction of strong emotion. Oh, poor me. Oh, this is terrible. Uh, so maybe it's anger. Maybe it's sadness. Whatever it is. But we'll get th that first reaction definitely comes. We, it happens to all of us. But then what happens, the, the important step is what happens next. Because then we have to decide to use our conscious mind, like our highest thinking, to stop the reaction and look at it and then decide, wait, 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 wait. Is this reaction the best one? Is this really the best choice or is there a better choice? Right, we, we use our conscious thinking brain to interrupt that reaction and then choose the strongest, the best possible mindset, belief, and then actions. That's what Santiago does. Something bad happens, right? The, the guy steals his, all his money. It's, it's bad. It's a bad event, of course. Step two. He has his natural emotional reaction. Oh, he's upset. He feels angry and upset and sad and depressed. Oh, victim. Oh, I'm a victim. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Again, this is completely natural. It happens very fast. He can't really control that. That's step two. But then step three. Then step three. After that first strong emotional reaction, he stops himself and he uses his thinking brain, his conscious brain, his highest intelligence, and he stops and he, he starts to ask questions. Wait, wait, 
Is this what I want to do? Is this really how I want to think? Do I really want to be a victim? Is there a better choice? Is there a better mindset? And he thinks and he thinks and then he chooses. He chooses with his rational mind, not just his emotions. He chooses with his highest intelligence a better mindset, a better attitude, and then of course a better action, which is to stay and keep going. That's a perfect example uh, for all of us. We can all use that same three-step example. Anytime something happens to us in life, especially something that's bad or unpleasant, bad luck, a failure, whatever. This helps us to understand because this is the natural process. Some people they think about this and they get upset they get angry at themselves like ah oh, why do I get so emotional why do I get so sad why am I so angry uh, because it's natural okay you, that, don't don't be angry or upset about that that f that first quick emotional reaction is just human nature most of us do that including me still happens to me when something bad happens my first reaction is still very emotional and often foolish <laughs> right uh, and maybe I'll that first emotional reaction maybe I'll focus on it for a day or a couple days yeah, if it's really bad maybe even for a couple weeks I'll just be sad or angry or upset if it's something small, maybe it just for just for a few minutes. That's okay. Don't feel bad about that. That's totally normal. You're human. That's going to happen. Most of the time that happens. When bad things happen, we get emotional, we get sad, we get angry, we get upset. Of course we do. The key thing is though, what do you do after that? That's the key thing, is to turn on your brain, turn on your intelligence, and start to look at it and then make a better choice. That's the difference between heroes, adventurers, successful people, happier people, and weak, unhappy people. The weak, unhappy people, they, they're stuck in the second part. They never leave the second part. They are sad and weak and upset forever. They hold on to the victim mindset and they never let go. They never change it. They stay in the victim mindset. They stay in that victim role. They become victims. This becomes who they are and they have this victim mentality. And then what's really bad is that this victim mentality gets stronger and stronger and then when they make other decisions about other things in life, they make bad decisions because they have a victim mindset, because they feel weak. And so things generally for those people, life gets worse and worse and worse. Usually for those people, life gets less and less happy as they get older. Less and less and less happy. They feel weaker and weaker and weaker. It's a bad way to live. It's a bad choice. <laughs> the second side of the victim mentality that you should be careful about is with other people. This is also a difficult one. So for example, Bad things will happen to other people, people you know in your life. Bad things will happen, right? Maybe a friend, maybe someone in your family. And then you have the exact same choice with them. Do you treat them like a victim? Do you tell them again and again that they are a victim? Poor you, poor you, poor you. This is also very easy to do. Now again, of course, that's probably the good and natural first reaction, 
right? Something, let's say you have a friend, something bad happens to them, they have some really bad luck, something difficult happens, whatever. So of course, immediately, you're just going to say, oh, I'm so sorry, that's terrible. Yeah, that's, that's again, human nature. You show that you care about them. You show, oh, I feel bad for you. Yes, 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 of course, that second step after the bad event, again, that f emotional reaction is natural and probably correct. You want to show them you care and you just feel bad for them. That's fine. Of course, I do that when something bad or difficult happens to people I care about. Again, nothing wrong with that. It's the third step, again, that is important with other people. You give them some time just to feel bad and to feel sad. Of course you do. But then what happens next? After that, do you continue to tell them they're a victim? Do you continue saying, poor you, poor you, oh, oh, oh? I mean, do you do that for weeks and weeks and months and months? Do you continue to focus on and blame other people for their problem? Well, guess what? When you do that, if you do that, you make them weaker. Because now you are encouraging them to think like a victim. You're encouraging them to have a victim mindset. You are not helping them anymore. Now you are hurting them. You're discouraging them. It's much better after a little time to change what you're t telling them and start to encourage them to think like a hero. So in the beginning, let's say their boss is mean to them and fires them for no reason. Okay, of, of course, the first thing you say is, oh, I'm so sorry you lost your job. Oh, that sucks. Your boss is terrible. Of course, you, you, you comfort them. But then, let's say a couple weeks later, you talk to them. You probably want to start to encourage them to think like a hero. Maybe this is a good opportunity for you. You didn't like your boss anyway. That job wasn't that great anyway. Now you have a chance to get a better job. Or now you have a chance to follow some dream you have. Now you have a chance to travel. Now you have a chance to start your own business. Right? You want to start encouraging them at this point to think like a hero. To th think and to feel powerful and powerfully. You probably have seen Lord of the Rings, right? The movie? Or read the book? I've read the, the books a few times. I love those books. The movies are also good. There's a great example of this. What we're talking about, this topic, there's a very good example in Lord of the Rings. It's in the s Two Towers, the second movie and the second book. The Two Towers. And there's the character of Wormtongue. Do you remember Wormtongue? Wormtongue is the advisor. He's an advisor, right? He gives advice. He's like the assistant to a king, King Theoden. So we have King Theoden and then his advisor, his assistant, Wormtongue, which is a great name. <laughs> Wormtongue. <laughs> when we first meet Theoden, right, the heroes come and they meet Theoden. The heroes are Aragorn and uh, Gimli and uh, Legolas. The elf, the dwarf, and the, the king, the, the man, Aragorn. So they come and they, they're, they, they need help from Theoden. They need his help because a big army's coming. A big army of orcs, of evil guys, they're coming. And they try th to convince Theoden. Theoden, you've got to fight. You need to fight. You're, you will be destroyed. All of us will be destroyed unless you fight. So stand up and fight with us. We will join you. Please join us and fight. Join us and fight. Be strong. But what happens? 
Well, Wormtongue, his assistant, whispers. He talks quietly into his ear, the king's ear, Theoden's ear, and he says, he, and he tells him, basically, you're a victim. Oh, you're too old to fight. Theoden, King Theoden, you're too old and you're, you're sick. Your body is not strong. It's too dangerous. And oh, be careful. Be careful. If you fight, then your kingdom will be destroyed. Be safe. Don't fight. You're too weak to fight. Be careful. All right, so Worm Tongue is constantly saying, whispering these victim messages to King Theoden, right? Constantly telling King Theoden, you're weak, you're a victim, don't fight, don't, you're, you're not strong enough, be careful, think like a victim, think like a victim, think like a victim. And so Theoden, he says, no, I, can't, I won't help you, right? And Theoden, even described in the book, you know, he's, he, he physically looks weak. His shoulders are down. His head is down. His voice is weak. Uh, he's, like a, he's like a weak, weak, weak old man. Because Wormtongue, for years, for years, Wormtongue has been saying these things in his ear constantly. You're weak. You're sick. You're a victim. Be careful. Don't fight. Don't be strong. Right? Victim mentality. Victim mentality. Victim mentality. And Theoden gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And so then in the book and in the movie, it seems, oh my god, this is, he's not going to help them. Everybody will be destroyed. And then the big hero Gandalf comes, right? Gandalf comes. The, the wizard. The old man mu musician, uh, magician. Kind of like the alchemist character, actually. In The Alchemist. Gandalf comes, and what does he do? He silences Wormtongue. Right? He scares Wormtongue. He says, Wormtongue! Basically, he says, Wormtongue, shut up! Right? He scares him and says, if you say another word, I'm going to, you know hit you in the head. <laughs> so he chases his worm tongue away. Gandalf gets rid of worm tongue. And then he says to Theoden, you are a king. You are strong. Stand up. And he kind of touches him and hits him and helps his body to heal. And then Theoden wakes up and realizes I'm not a victim. I am a king. I'm a hero. And he stands up and his body gets stronger. And his voice gets strong and he stands up and he says, yes, we will fight. And he calls his armies. And of course, later in the, later in the story, he, he fights well, several, two, two actually, big, big battles. And he, and he becomes a great, strong hero. So, see, Tolkien, the writer of Lord of the Rings, Tolkien is giving us the same message, right? And he's doing it really well, too, using the character of Wormtongue. Wormtongue is the victim mentality, right? That's exactly what Wormtongue represents. Wormtongue is the victim mindset. And Gandalf is the hero mindset. And in the two towers in that book, right, Theoden is fighting. He's, he's, he's also struggling. He's, he's, in the beginning, he's choosing the victim mindset, and he's weak and weak and weak. And then Gandalf helps him to become the hero and to grow strong by getting rid of the, right? What does he do? Gandalf gets rid of Wormtongue. Gandalf gets rid of that victim mentality. And then Theoden becomes big and strong and a hero. Same message. It's a great message. And so we see with the alchemist, we see with Lord of the Rings, this same message, which is to stand up. In fact, Gandalf actually says that to Theoden, right? Stand up! He's sitting all with his shoulders down and his head down, and he says, stand up! You are a king! And Theoden stands up, right? And he seems to grow stronger as soon as he stands up. 
Santiago, the same thing in The Alchemist. He's feeling bad. Oh, poor me, poor me, poor, poor me. I'm a victim, but then he thinks about it, and then when he chooses, when he decides, no, I am an adventurer. I'm an adventurer. I'm a hero. I am staying here. I will continue. I don't know how. I, I don't know how, but I will continue. I will go to the pyramids. I'm not going home. I'm not going to quit. And at that moment, he also becomes much stronger. He becomes stronger. He was feeling bad. He was feeling weak. Poor me. And then as soon as he makes this decision, as soon as he changes his mindset, immediately he becomes much, much stronger. And we will see later in the story, of course, actually in the next part of the story, he has more challenges, but he also has, he learns a lot and he has some great experiences and he gets good new skills. He overcomes lots of more challenges and each step of this journey for Santiago, he gets stronger and stronger and stronger, mentally stronger, more and more of a real hero. And of course he gets wiser and wiser and wiser. He learns more and more and more. And in the Lord of the Rings, the same happens to Theoden after he stands up, after they chase away, Wormtongue, Wormtongue runs away. Theoden grows stronger and stronger and stronger as a king, as a leader, until, you know, he f his final big battle, and he dies a hero in that story. Strong without fear. Powerful messages in both stories. We're getting the same message, which is be very careful of the victim mentality. You must chase it away. It will come. It is a natural reaction. Almost every human has this reaction when difficult times come, when bad things happen. But then you must chase it away. Just like worm tongue. When this victim mentality comes, you must chase it away and stand up. You must choose to stand up, choose the hero mindset, choose the adventurer mindset, choose the explorer mindset. All right, and choose to join my VIP program. Choose to speak English powerfully. Choose to speak English fluently. Choose to speak English effortlessly. Choose to think in English. Join my VIP program today. Join now at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Join now. Join now at EffortlessEnglishClub.com.